First Peter. Does somebody say First John? First Peter. We're in chapter two now. We made it. Okay, I'm going to tell you a little story that you probably know pretty well, uh, and I'm going to do it through a song. The wise man built his house upon the rock, and the foolish man built his house upon the... Okay, now I'm going to ask you a question. What is the rock? Jesus. Yes, that is the Sunday school answer, but it's not the right one. What is the rock according to that passage? Not just the word, but what about the word? Doing the word. Doing the word. Jesus says, anyone who hears these words of mine and does them is like a man who builds his house upon a rock. And likewise, anyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them or disregards them or rejects them, he's like a foolish man who builds his house on the sand. And when the storm comes and the waves come and the wind blows, the wise man who built his house upon the solid rock foundation of hearing the word and doing the word will stand. And trust me, the storms will come. The storm will come. Hearing the word and obeying it, and hearing the word and not obeying it. This is the difference. Does anyone know where this location is, by the way? Mont St. Michael in France. We're going to go visit Natalie's sister in France, and we may have a chance to see that place. And I've, I've wanted to see it since I was in high school, so I'm stoked about it. The other one looks like Aunt Josephine's house from Lemony Snicket series of unfortunate events. <laughs> Today, we are going to talk about spiritual maturity and building your your, your lives on the solid rock foundation of the cornerstone of Christ. Let's read the passage together. Hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, this is 1 Peter 2, verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind, like newborn babes crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a royal priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, as we dive into this passage, reveal its truth to us. Show us what we ought to know. Lord, I pray that the study time that uh, I did this week and that Ty and I did together, I pray that you would help, uh, help me to fully convey the truth by your power, that I would not rely on my own strength or ability. Father, I fully rest upon you. I build my life upon you, the cornerstone. I pray that I would declare this truth with boldness and that it would make sense to us, that we could live it out. We love you, God. I pray these things in your name. Amen. This is what this chapter is all about, that the church is not just a building but a people. 
a royal priesthood of living stones with a rock-solid identity built upon the cornerstone of Christ. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, holiday who be whaty? What does that mean? Can you explain that to me? Well, it's because there are three metaphors in this passage. Uh, as we were studying this passage this week, uh, Ty said, do you feel like maybe this passage uh, deserves like four sermons? <laughs> yeah, it probably does, but we're going to fly over it at 25,000 feet, and I'm going to point out some things. So bear with me, stick with me, and let's dive right into the passage. We're going to figure out what does it mean to be a royal priesthood? What does it mean to be a living stone? And what does it mean to build your life upon the cornerstone of Christ? We need to see three things in this passage. In order to have the spiritual maturity to understand this analogy and these, these metaphors, the prerequisite is that you must be born again. If we look back at verse uh, 22 uh, and verse 21 in chapter 1, through him you believe in God who raised you from the dead and glorified him so that your faith and hope are in God. Now that you've been purified by obeying the truth so that you have a sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, remember this, born again, not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable seed, born of God. You are now a child of God. You are a newborn babe of God. You are born again. That's the prerequisite. Then, to understand the, the analogies that are put forth in this passage, you have to see these three things. When you become a believer, you begin to crave the Word of God because you recognize that you need the Word of God, and so you begin to crave it. Your perspective begins to change from a self-serving, self-motivated lifestyle to a self-sacrificing life. You begin to look like Jesus that Christ is the cornerstone, that you are not the center of the universe, that he is the center. And finally, you understand your identity and your purpose being built upon the foundation of Christ and that you are now a vessel of truth that brings peace and hope and love and grace and mercy from God through you to other people. You're the vessel of truth. So you crave the word, your perspective shifts, and you understand your identity. So this passage begins, therefore rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. I used to have this uh, test when I was a youth pastor in Iowa to see if you were in high school or not. And it had two questions. The, uh, the first question was, uh, do you have a headache? If the answer was yes, okay. Um, are you tired? Yes. You're in high school! Because literally every student would enter our house and say, oh, I'm so tired, and I have a headache. Because <laughs> life in high school can be hard, trust me. But I figured it out. There was something else going on. What did you have for breakfast? A Mountain Dew and a pizza. I'm not joking. That's breakfast in high school in Iowa. Maybe it is here too. I don't know. But there, would be, there was this grocery store, or uh, uh, we called it the C store, convenience store, down at the bottom of the hill, just below the high school. And the high school kids would go there at 7.30 in the morning and get a slice of pizza, probably from the day before. And like, you know, with, there would be breakfast pizza. So there'd be like sausage and bacon and eggs on this pizza. And they would eat that and then pound a Mountain Dew. And then later they would say, oh, I feel terrible. I just can't figure out why. <laughs> I'll tell you why. Because your body responds to what you put into it. Listen, listen to what Paul says, uh, Peter says. So used to saying that. Listen to what Peter says. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. These are things that are coming out of you. They're coming out of you. Slander. Deceit, that can be something you also do to yourself. Hypocrisy, malice, envy. Why are they coming out? Because they have found their way in. The things that you watch, the things that you listen to, the things that perhaps you are, your identity. Jesus puts it this way. 
A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart. This is someone who's regenerated by Christ. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So one indicator that you may not be born again, which is the prerequisite for spiritual maturity, are the things that come out of your mouth, the behavior that you do on a consistent basis. Jesus also says it this way, it is the fruit that you bear. A bad tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Uh, bad tree cannot bear good fruit, <laughs> and a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Out of your heart is what will come out. And so if you don't crave the word of God, if you don't crave the word of God, as a newborn babe craves its mother's milk, you may not be born again. You may not be a newborn babe of Christ. Newborn babies intuitively know that they need nourished. I think that's why they come out crying. I think they also come out crying because it was warm and dark and quiet, and all of a sudden it's bright and cold and loud. <laughs> that's probably another reason why. But they need to be fed, and they know it right away. Those who are truly born again know what they need. Have you ever been around someone who's just become a believer? I mean, they, they truly accepted Christ as their Savior, and they have Jesus reigning and ruling in their hearts where once they were living in darkness. They can't get enough of God's word. I saw this at, at Bible school. Uh, there, I told you about my friend, Stev, who liked to pray with swear words. When he became a believer, his life began to transform. And he could not get enough of the Bible. He was constantly in God's word because he craved it like a newborn baby. He craved the word of God because he knew that it was in the words of the scriptures that he would receive life, that God was giving him and allowing him to flourish with spiritual life. He was beginning to grow and mature. So when you become a believer, when you become a follower of Christ, and you are a newborn babe in Christ, and you begin to saturate yourself with the word, there's something else that happens. You're, you have a, a change in identity, a shift in who you are, and you are able to come to God. You are able to approach the throne of God with confidence because you have new clothing. See, you can't just decide that you want to go to the moon and hop on the spaceship with, with no gear, and then step out of the spaceship and be like, I made it to the moon! What would happen to you? You would implode because of the lack of air. It's a vacuum. You need the proper clothing. You can't just visit the sun without the proper attire. No one's done it before because we can't invent something that could do that. You can't go there because the sun will destroy you, and you can't go out into the vacuum of space without the proper clothing, or you'll be destroyed. You cannot approach a holy God without the proper clothing. We just sang about this, clothed in his righteousness. You need to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ in order to approach a holy God. And listen to what verse says, verse 4 says, as you come to him, the living stone, as you come to him. When you become a believer, you have the ability to come to him. Because you've been born again of God and you've been clothed in his righteousness, you now have the proper attire. But it wasn't always this way. It wasn't always this way. God had a relationship with his people that was very specific. It started off by God giving the law to Moses, the Ten Commandments on, on Mount Sinai. He gives the Ten Commandments to Moses and he says, I had chosen Abraham, and from Abraham, Isaac, Isaac, Jacob, and all of the people of God who were in exile in Egypt, who were in slavery in Egypt, they've been released and set free from the slavery of Egypt, and now God was bringing them into the promised land. And he said, now that this relationship has been established, I must give you what is required to approach me. I'm holy, and I don't want you to be destroyed in this relationship. And so God set forth a very specific way for his people to approach him. And it was through the Levitical law. It was through the Ten Commandments. It was through the priesthood. 
This is a picture of what, uh, the, the previous picture was the tabernacle. I don't know if you recognize that. This is the, the temporary mobile church, kind of like what we have now. It, it's a, it was a mobile church that moved around wherever the people would go. And that was the tabernacle of God that had a very specific place that the priests were to por- perform the duties. And there was a, a spot called the Holy of Holies where the Ark of the Covenant rested. And God, you can kind of see, that, I don't know that that's what God looks like, but God's presence would rest on the mercy seat. And they could only approach God through the priests. The priests were mediators. And so this next picture is what the temple looked like when Solomon built the temple. And this is what the temple looked like at the time of Jesus. This is at a museum in Israel when Natalie and I went. This model is ginormous. It's like the size of this gymnasium. It's crazy. And so God said, here's the law, Ten Commandments, and the the Levitical law. This is purification laws and celebration laws. There were 600 plus of those laws. So you have to follow the Ten Commandments, which they couldn't even do that. So then God gave them 600 more, and they definitely couldn't do that. And so they needed their sin to be covered in order to approach a a holy God. And so God said, I will accept this blood sacrifice, and what the blood does is it reminds us that the wages, the payment for sin, is death. It causes death. They would see the blood, they would smell the blood, and it would remind them that their sin is this bad. It causes this much pain. It causes death. The sacrifices were performed by the priests. The high priests were mediators between the people and God, and the priests themselves would have to give, make sacrifices for themselves. We're going to get into Hebrews here in a second, so I can unpack it a little more. Faith in God, in his word, and his provision was the key. You had to believe that this system, this system of sacrifice and the laws that they had to perform year after year was the way that they had to put on the proper attire to approach a holy God. Now, this is why I'm really glad that we live in the day and age that we do. This is from Hebrews chapter 5. This is, this is very cool. <laughs> Every high priest, back then, they were selected from among people, from all the, the Levites, and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. The priest knows, the high priest, who was a mediator between God and man, he knows that he himself is subject to sin, and sacrifices were performed on his behalf too, so that he could approach a holy God. This is why they tied a rope around the high priest when he would go in to perform the, the incense in the holy place just before the holy holies, because if he wasn't pure enough, he would die, and they would drag him out. He's able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and going astray since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. I would imagine that if some people, you know, they drew the straws, it's your turn. I would be terrified. I would be terrified. This is why I'm glad we live when we do. This is from Hebrews chapter 9, so later. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made with human hands. That is to say, it is not a part of this creation. He did not enter it by means of the blood of goats and calves. He entered the most holy place once and for all by his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. The blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkled on those who are ceremonial. They're they're clean on the outside, ceremonially clean sanctify them so that they are outwardly clean. This is what this is saying. All of the sacrifices, all of the law and the Ten Commandments, the Levitical priesthood, all of that was a picture of what was supposed to happen and what was required if we were to try and do what God requires to approach him. And what it was to show us was that we cannot do it. We cannot keep the law. It required blood sacrifices over and over and over again, year after year. How much more then will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from acts 
that lead to death, so that we may serve the living God. For this is the reason Christ is the mediator of a new promise, a new covenant, that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, now that he has died as a ransom to, select, to set them free from the sin committed under the first covenant. Jesus came, just like the high priests were mediators between us, sinful man, and a holy God, and they had to perform all of these sacrifices. They had to obey all the law of God and perform the sacrifices from blood that wasn't even their own. Jesus comes, fulfills the law, and with his own body, not through a temple, but his own body and his own blood becomes the sacrifice for our sins. And so the author of Hebrews concludes it this way. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that's not even his own. Otherwise, Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world to pay for every person, but he has appeared once for all at the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Just as people are destined to die once and after that face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many and he will appear a second time, not to bear sins, but to bring salvation for those who are waiting for him. That's where we are right now. Christ has made the sacrifice, paid for our sins and given us a job to do. Finally, he says it this way. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses. Jesus knows exactly what it's like to be a human. But we have one who, is able, who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can come to God clothed in the righteousness of Christ because it's already been done for us. It's been done. It's finished, Jesus said. And now I give to you a brand new identity. You are going to be born again like a brand new baby. The sacrifices have been complete for your sin. When you receive Christ as your Savior, you are born again. So what are you building your life upon? Are you building your life upon your own merit? Because this is, this is the difference. This is what people think. They think like the Israelites think. Which, by the way, if you ever read the Old Testament, like, uh, for example, David and Goliath, if you read that story, a lot of times people will say, oh, David and Goliath, um, we all have our own Goliaths in our life, and we just need to be like David and trust in God and fight it. No, no, no. That's, that's not the right analogy. We are the Israelites. We're the Israelites cowering in fear because of the enemy. Jesus is David. Jesus has defeated sin and death once and for all. When you look at the Old Testament narratives, when you look at the sacrifices that were performed, we are like the Israelites. We think that by our own good deeds, we can please God and we can come to him and we can approach him because we're good. No, that, that's, that's not true. You need Christ. You need Jesus Christ. You need perfection and righteousness. You need holiness to approach God. And the only way you can have that relationship is through the gospel, that we, all of us, were once in sin. We were once in darkness, as it's going to tell us. We once had no mercy, but now we have received mercy. We can come to him. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God. This is verse 4 in 1 Peter. You also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You are now a royal priesthood. Um, I was listening to this Bob Dylan song the other day. The chorus, you guys might know it. How does it feel? On that Hammond organ, so cool. How does it feel? To be on your own, with no direction, like a complete unknown, like a rolling stone. The whole world is living this way. They're living like the Israelites. They're, they're having to depend on their own good deeds and own, 
own works. And they're trying to figure out what life is about. Oh, that sounds good. This little piece of truth over here. We'll, uh, we'll put that little piece of truth right here. And I, you know what? That's good. And oh, actually, if I don't believe this, I could get in big trouble. Let's put that one there too. And they build their own foundation on random things instead of a cornerstone. Now, this is really interesting. I was reading about what a cornerstone is. A cornerstone, this is, this is from an architecture magazine. In relation to architecture, a cornerstone is traditionally the first stone laid for a structure, with all other stones laid in reference to that stone. A cornerstone marks the geographical location by orienting the building in a specific direction. Christ is the cornerstone. He has laid out a very specific direction, and he has made provision for the rest of the building. Listen to what this says. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men but chosen by God and precious to him, you too, like living stones, like you're being built on top of it, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, mediator between God and man with a message of reconciliation, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For Scripture says this, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone, and a stone that causes men to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall, and they stumble because of their disobedience. They disobey the message. This is what they were destined for. See, if you try to build your life upon deceptive philosophy, human tradition, political ideology, the zeitgeist that is like the cultural narrative of the day, if you try to build your life on those things, it will be like building your house upon the sand. But if you build your life upon the word of God and the truth of the gospel and the person and work of Jesus Christ, and you do it, you obey it. You believe it by faith and you do it. You are building your life upon the solid rock of Christ. So to be spiritually mature, you have to crave the word of God so that you understand it. We, I just took you through Hebrews. Did you know that Hebrews is one of the hardest books in the Bible to understand? It's incredibly difficult to understand. You read that book, there is so many layers of truth in that book that you have to dive in to see the treasure. The treasure's there, but you have to dive in. You have to soak yourself and saturate yourself in the word to understand it. And then you begin to see the truth, and you begin to love the truth, and you begin to live the truth. The world builds itself on these things. And, and I didn't get these things from nowhere. It's from uh, Colossians chapter 2. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. For in Christ, all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He is the head over every power and authority. Everyone in the world has a source of authority. Everyone has some source of authority, and it's threefold. It's either you, you are God, and you determine what truth is and what reality looks like, or it's another person, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, Buddha, whoever it might be, uh, and you rest your ideologies and your worldview and truth on them, or it's God, and God is who he says he is, and you believe it by faith. Those are the three things. The first two are human, human beings. And God, creator of the universe, is not a man that he should lie. And he gives us his truth right here in his word. The cornerstone sets the standard of your life and the way that you will live your life. Verse 9 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his light. Look at verse 9 again. You're a chosen people. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation, 
a people belonging to God. Does that sound familiar? This is an identity. This is an identity. What does it say in verse 1? You are God's elect. You are God's elect. Strangers in the world scattered. This is an identity. This is who you are in Christ. You have been chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless. You are a royal priesthood so that you are a, like a mediator between people who do not know God. You have the message of truth and you who do know God. You are like a priesthood. You are a holy nation. Not, I'm not talking about America. I'm talking about you, the church, big C church, not a building, but a people. We are a people who bring the message of truth to a world that is in darkness. And you belong to God. You're God's. He bought you with his blood. That's how much he loves you. He cares for you. He carries your infirmities. He washes you clean. He makes you a part of his family. You belong to him. Why? So that you may declare what God has done for you. So that you may declare to the world, I've been made right with God. And it's not through yearly sacrifices, blood sacrifices from bulls and goats year after year, and not by obeying the Ten Commandments and by obeying the Levitical law, And I don't need a high priest who's a man whose blood could never pay for my sins. I have Jesus. He's a great high priest who paid for my sins with his own body, with his own blood, so that I could be a member of his family. I belong to him. Oh, let me tell you about the darkness I once lived in, the ignorance that I once lived in, the shaky, rocky, fluid foundation of the philosophies of this world that I used to rest my whole identity upon until the waves came and the wind came and it shattered my heart and I realized that that was the shakiest foundation. I had no idea who I was until I met Christ. Until I met Jesus Christ. He's a cornerstone. He's a rock-solid foundation. And like a newborn baby, I crave the word like a baby craves milk. I need the word so that I can understand this, so that I can live this, so that I can do this. I can come to him and approach his throne of grace with confidence, knowing that he hears my prayer, that he delights in using my prayer, that he uses his word to transform my heart and mold me and make me more like him. This is your testimony, simply speaking about the joy that you have in Christ. Um, Brad, do you guys know Brad Williams? <laughs> Uh, Brad and Layla, Brad t- told me the other day, uh, Casey, I-, I hear that you come into Good Seed a lot. Uh, he and his wife own and operate Good Seed, the coffee shop. And he said, I, I heard that you come into Good Seed a lot. I also heard that you're, that you're kind of loud. <laughs> and he said, and that's a wonderful thing because you're always talking about Jesus. <laughs> and I guess maybe that's my way of sharing my testimony. I think I'm just loud. I just have a lot of energy. <laughs> and I get excited about the word of God. This is, we're biting off way more than we can chew in, the, in these 12 verses. This is literally like eight sermons. We're, fly, we're flying right over it. So I appreciate you guys following along. But I get excited about stuff like this. Listen to this. Dear friends, verse, verse 11. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from the sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day that he visits. Well, how could you have that sort of demeanor? How could you have that sort of resting personality? Well, look at verse 10. Once you were not a people... But now you are a people, a people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. In view of God's mercy, Romans 12, 1 and 2, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. It's it's a spiritual act of worship. You live your life in such a way that other people can see who you are. I want to describe this with another children's song. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. 
You guys know that song? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. That's okay that you were too embarrassed to sing it. <laughs> we shine our light so that other uh, that's the candle, by the way. We shine our light so that other people can see Christ in us. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, think about that. If you believe what Jesus says and obey his word, are there going to be people that accuse you of doing wrong? Yeah, it's the people who build their life on the stilts, on the fluid thinking of the day, on the zeitgeist, on the philosophies of this world, because it's what's right, it's what's correct and right, right here, right now. The word of God is living and active. The word of God endures forever. It's for you've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living word of God. This does not falter or fail or return void. It is everlasting because God is everlasting. And so if you build your life on that, is the world going to hate you? Yes, because the world is upside down and they're looking at you and you look upside down when you're the only one who's right side up standing on the word of God. This is truth and the world hates truth. Ironically, the truth is the only thing that's going to set the world free. And so if you're shining your light, yeah, it's going to be abrasive. It's going to be really abrasive. If you've been living in darkness, you ever been sleeping and someone comes in your room and flips on the light? Yeah, you want to kill that person because the, the light's shining in your eyes. You're like, ah, this is what happens when people hear the gospel, the truth. But if God is working in their hearts unto salvation, when they hear it, when they taste it, they're going to say, I've never tasted anything like that before. What is this? I don't understand this. Jonathan Lehman, he's a, he's a pastor and an author that I really like. Uh, he told this amazing story of a classmate he had in seminary, and uh, it was a te- his classmate's testimony. His classmate was um, from uh, a part of Africa, North Africa, where he, he actually grew up in a Muslim family. And uh, one day, they, he and his friend found a Bible, and they were drug dealers, and they used to roll their own joints and, and sell these, joint, these marijuana joints. And so, the, I don't know if you guys have noticed, but Bibles would make really good wrapping paper for joints. I wouldn't know anything about that, I promise. So you, you rip it out, and you put the weed in there, and you, you roll it up, and it's that crinkly paper, it's real thin, you know. He, he and his friend thought, this is perfect, They're rolling marijuana joints. One day, he had ripped out a paper that he was going to use to roll, and he read these words. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. He could not stop thinking about that. Day after day, he thought about it. He thought, where did we get that Bible? Oh, it was outside that building. I wonder if there are Christians in that building. Maybe, maybe he'd be able to explain it to me. So he went back to this building. Sure enough, he found a pastor. And the pastor of that church shared the gospel with him. He had tasted, he had seen that the Lord is good, and it radically transformed his life. His family rejected him. His friends hated him. He eventually had to escape with his wife and his kids to America, and today he he got his education, and today he's a pastor who preaches the truth of God and holds out his light for others to see who are in darkness. Do you, know, do you know who you are? And do you know whose you are? If you belong to Christ, if you belong to God, you have a little, little light to shine. And your light is your life, which is built upon the rock, solid, firm foundation of the word of God and the gospel of Jesus, his work and his person. If you're doing that, people will be able to see your light but you better be ready. You got to know the word because they're going to ask you questions. They're going to ask you tough questions because a lot of people who even build their life on shaky things have their shaky life real figured out and they will ask you difficult questions. But when you bring the truth to bear, their lowercase t truth, that is no truth at all, 
it does not have Holy Spirit power in it. The Word of God does. The Word of God does. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his light. I quote this probably every Sunday. (laughs) Out of darkness and into his light. That's who you are. You belong to Christ, and your identity is in him, built upon the solid foundation, the cornerstone of Jesus Christ. I'd like to pray for us that God would allow us to be exactly this. Father, when I look at this passage and I see our identity and I see who we are, um, I, I confess it's very difficult to maintain this consistent, constant perspective. We have to have our perspective changed and shifted. Lord, I pray that we would not look like the darkness of the world, but that we would be changed like newborn babies, that we would crave the pure spiritual milk of the word of God, that we would find that it is nutritious, that it's delicious, that we want it, that we want to grow and mature and become like you, Jesus, self-sacrificing, that you're the center of our attention and the center of our universe, and that we would be vessels of truth, ambassadors of the light. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, your bloodshed. The the blood of bulls and goats could never take away sins. It was only a symbol and a shadow of the things that were to come. I pray that we would remind people that there is hope, that there is joy to be found in salvation, that Jesus following you fills us up, that when we're filled with you, the things that come out of our mouth the things that we do and our obedience to you is evidence to the world that something radical has taken place, that we are transformed by the word. God, help us to be a people of the word. I pray that the discipline it requires would not be off-putting so that we forget the joy that it brings and that that joy is inexplicable. That joy goes beyond anything this world could provide. Thank you, God, for that truth. We love you. Thank you for loving us. May we be a people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, God's own possession. We love you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Um, We have a special announcement today. I'm going to invite Pastor Jay to come up. And uh, before before you come up, Jay, I just want to say a few things. Uh, When I first moved here and I met Jay Marshall... I had just learned that Jay is the father of one of my Bible professors at EBC, who is my favorite Bible professor, uh, John Marshall. (laughs) So I thought, well, if Jay is anything like John, this is going to be the best job I've ever had. (laughs) And from the get-go, Jay has always supported me, cared for me, loved me like a son, He has provided ample wisdom. He's shown me how to be discerning, how to be diplomatic. And Jay has become a dear, dear friend of mine. And so it's, I don't know if you've ever been in a situation where you're working with someone, a coworker who is a dear friend. It's a blessing. It's a huge blessing. Um, Jay, I'd like to invite you uh, up, and then I'd like to say a few things after. Testing, testing. Ah, uh, wow. Uh, this is not easy. I have uh, preached, I think, over 600 sermons in my 15 years at this church, and I think this is the most difficult <laughs> that I've ever had. Um, I want to begin by thanking the elder board and Pastor Casey uh, for their commitment to a unified pastoral transition. It's been amazing. It's, it's really, I'm sure our elders, I thank each of you as elders, because I know there are a lot of people who came to you and said it's not possible. It doesn't work. 
They've tried it. It just doesn't work. Uh, I want to tell you that you as a church have been a part of a miracle, really. It is a miracle when the church transitions through the pastor leadership. Uh, many churches ended up in division, and they end up taking a year, two or three years to kind of regain momentum. And uh, I tell you, I, I can't tell you much. I love Casey. It has been just an absolute joy to work with him, to be around him. Um, and actually, for the last several months, I've kind of sensed that God might be leading me to resign my staff position at BCF and move to Orange County to work with my son, Jonathan, in developing the church he planted in Santa Ana. It's quite an honor for me to that he wants me to come. He's been begging me to come for two or three years now, and I keep saying, no, my time's not finished at BCF yet. Uh, to give you a little taste, he is very much like Casey. Passionate, loving, committed to the Word of God, and it's really like been working with my son to be able to be with Casey. So this has been a very difficult decision for me since I love the people at BCF. We have been through a lot together in 16 years. Um, after I'd been here about six months, one of the elders came to me and said, Pastor Jay, um, if you had been two weeks later, we would not have been able to pay you. Our finances were at that state. There was a time in the life of this church when, after March, we were projected to end up $250,000 behind budget. And we came to you as God's family, and we ended up, by the end of the year, $150,000 ahead. That binds you to people who really love God and are willing to commit themselves to following him. But after teaching for many years that... We must be following God even when it's difficult. I've decided that probably August 31st is the right time for me to finish my work here at Valley Christian Fellowship. I'm grateful for the love, the care, and the support that Pastor Casey and the elders have extended to me during this decision-making process. It's been heavenly. I've always dreamed that I would be able to leave a church that was highly united and committed and... Uh, doing well, and the leadership here has really made a major difference for me. Churches often experience division and disunity when transitioning from one pastor to another. I'm thankful for Pastor Casey and the elder board and you <laughs> as BCF members for the smooth, unified transition of our pastoral leadership. I love and highly respect Pastor Casey and have enjoyed every minute under his guidance. I hope those who attend VCF will never forget the supernatural way God led him to join our staff. Seldom have I seen such a dramatic leading of the Holy Spirit. If you don't know the story, you've got to hear it. I'll, I'll just summarize it in a couple of sentences. As we were looking for a youth pastor, we had a young man show up in our office who said he was from Iowa and he wanted to apply for our youth pastor job. I'm a little prejudiced. I don't think that people from Iowa or Texas <laughs> understand California. So I told my men, okay, get a video, do the regular process. That's fine. We probably won't ever talk to this person again. <laughs> we asked him to make a video. He sent the video within 24 hours, and I was hooked. It was absolutely amazing. You've experienced his teaching ability here. It was just amazing. And then as we talked and shared together, I realized, wow, he really is an amazing man of God. And we brought him on, and of course, he was much more than just a youth pastor. He has become just an amazing senior pastor for all of us. While the average tenure for a senior pastor is four years, I've enjoyed serving BCF for over 15 years. I want to thank all who have given their resources, their time, their energy to enable VCF to have a significant impact in the valley. I believe the foundation has been laid for BCF to have an even greater impact in the years ahead. I'm looking forward to coming back in five years and you have a building and you've got all these people that are just loving Jesus 
because I believe that's the potential under Pastor Casey's leadership. BCF is very fortunate to have Pastor Casey's leadership, and I pray you will give him your full support and encouragement. He's a great leader, I think, for three reasons. He genuinely loves people. He genuinely loves God, and he genuinely loves the Bible. Thank you for your prayers and support for these 15 years. As you might remember, we had a celebration Sunday some, uh, I think it was about a month and a half ago, so uh, a couple months ago, and we're having another celebration Sunday on August 29th, and on that Sunday, we're going to celebrate our pastor of 15 years, Jay. I, I want to pray for you. Amen. Father, I'm so grateful for your faithfulness. Amen. Just serving alongside Jay these three and a half years and seeing the move of God, mm -hmm. seeing people come to know you as their savior, people baptized, seeing this church thrive and grow and, and through an extremely difficult time. Mm -hmm. God, thank you for Jay's leadership. Thank you for his faithfulness. Father, I pray that you would bless him, guide his steps, provide for his needs, he and Suzanne. Mm -hmm. Remind them of your steadfast love. Mm -hmm. Father, we look forward to the remainder of this summer that we get to continue to celebrate um, his ability to teach and lead and guide and shepherd this church. Mm -hmm. And we look forward to the, the celebration Sunday when we can truly honor him and, and his work here, his faithfulness to your call. God, you are incredible. We give you all the praise and glory and honor that is due. Mm -hmm. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.